uh, hello. Thank you for taking your time to uh, listen to me uh, to uh, my ramblings. Uh, this is a talk, as uh, Chris has said, of about hunting for log for cell compromises. Okay, this is based on an experience that uh, me and other members of my team we had during December 2021, just after log for cell was uh, revealed. Uh, we did this in two different companies uh, because they needed to know if they have been compromised prior to the to the disclosure of the of the vulnerability. Okay, so let's go into let's go into start. Okay, it's a very Christmas theme presentation, by the way. It's just uh, for me, it's very difficult to separate that time of the uh, this that time of the year from this theme that we don't do in the Christmas. So some introductions, of course. So I'm Jose Angel Garcia. I'm senior incident handler in CIA third, and I have been involved in cybersecurity since 2013. Uh, prior to being in CIA, just in NASOC. And since uh, 2018, I have been in a uh, field in CIA third. And we, we do a little bit of everything. We do from tabletop exercise to training simulations to post incident, post -incident assessments and everything in between. Um, and in this case, we did a compromise assessment, and I will explain what is uh, that for you because I, I don't think that is normal uh, terminology. So a Christmas tale, okay? It's going to set that, set up the mood. Uh, Lock for sale is the Grinch because it can ruin your Christmas. It almost did it with mine. And Lock for sale was uh, revealed on December 10th, as I think has already discussed here today. Uh, in allow an unskilled attacker to basically embed uh, arbitrary code in the user agent uh, part of uh, HTTP request and basically arbitrarily co execute code in, an, in a target system. Okay, it had a, a score of 10.0, it has been done, so it was really, really serious. But another thing made it even worse uh, three things. Okay, it was revealed on a Thursday. And it's not trivial to patch for the for the development teams. Uh, also, these teams were already under staff. Uh, it was prior prior to Christmas, uh, just one week before everybody was going on holidays and stuff. And also, it was in the midst of Omicron, so a lot of uh, key people were was on on sick leave. So that really hampered their their response. Uh, so and. Um, Apart from that, uh, the first update, uh, the first uh, patch was, wasn't enough to address the vulnerability. Uh, by the end of, the, of this whole saga, three, three patches have been released in less than just two weeks. That's, that really, really messed with the, with the people trying to patch all the servers and all the critical infrastructure. Uh, so real mitigation efforts uh, couldn't be taken until Monday 13 effective mitigation efforts. So this make a lot of people very, very nervous. Uh, and it's a really serious vulnerability left alone, not alone, but kind of during a uh, weekend. What can go wrong in this? So that's, uh, so I'm an incident handler. Why I have been involved with this? Okay. Uh, well, a public exploit was a Bible. Uh, rumors of uh, log for sale being used at zero day uh, were around. Okay, uh, I sustained rumors, but not uh, not all that it could have been. Uh, strain detection teams uh, have have enough on their plate already, and this uh, this was an overhead that they couldn't uh, assume. So the incident response team was activated uh, to provide muscle to the local teams. Uh, and this is the story on how our team uh, take take on this. It's not uh, the, the only way. Uh, it's, I for sure is not the best way, but we are here to share and also to learn. Okay, so some background on the vulnerability. For sure, you are very familiar with it, but I feel that we need to cover. So, log for j is everywhere. It's everywhere. Uh, and it's not only in web servers or in web applications. It's in things that, that in an enterprise environments are, are quite prevalent and quite important. In Cisco products, here you have examples, uh, Amazon Web Services, IBM, uh, QRadar, a uh, module of QRadar was affected by this. So do you really want an RCE vulnerability on your CM? 
yeah. Uh, Fortinet uh, was also affected, and over 40 products of BM work. So uh, that makes uh, this compound the, the vulnerability. So a little bit of a timeline. This vulnerability was introduced in 2013 when uh, the lookup uh, feature was introduced. This is a quite useful uh, feature of our enterprise environments, but it introduced uh, some, some dangers. Uh, already in 2014, uh, applications were crashed due to unhandled exceptions. So that's not something that you want in a public face uh, application. And uh, some mitigations were introduced, uh, like the no lookups or for local configuration, and another one for globally this disable this feature uh, for all the your whole uh, system. Okay. And in 2016, uh, Black Hat Black Hat talk uh, was uh, uh, investigated about how GNDI lookups on on untrusted resources could lead to a um, remote code execution, okay? Uh, we identified three main vectors, LDAP, R R RMI, Curva, and here you have the link. Uh, they did much better, a much better work that I can do explaining this. They also have a white paper on this, and I think the, the talk is on YouTube, so I'll check it out because um, it can, uh, it re is really a good talk. Uh, well, let's go to jump the, the next one. Uh, this December 10th, that is when the vulnerability is closed. But according to Cloudflare, the vulnerability had been, there were attempts of exploitation since December 1st. Uh, that makes a lot of people really, really nervous right now. That's why the zero day exploit uh, rumors were around. Okay. How it works? Well, we have a, a phase one, the request, the malicious request to the uh, vulnerable Java application. Then a second phase when the, that application performs an LDAP uh, resolution, gets uh, an answer and goes for the malicious results, okay? To the payload, to the final payload. It can be, as uh, already Jan has uh, covered, uh, just normal base64 base uh, encode commands, or it can be a a class resource with a custom class loader and everything in between. Okay. Uh, um, once it, this is done, okay, you have they have to come back to the attacker because what the good is to exploit an application if you don't know if you have been successful. Okay, that's the third stage. So uh, the second stage is important for us right now uh, in in this work because uh, it's going to will allow us to filter which resources we have to uh, put into doing digital forensic and incident response on, on compromised assets. Okay. Well, we have to do this in an entire organization. So it's a, it's a C and we only have a bucket. So how are we going to, to approach this? Okay. First, why we speak of compromise assessment? Well, I'm not first hunting because it could be very similar for some people. Uh, third hunting is plan. Uh, you you go there, you go for after a TTP, and then you investigate that. Uh, you use methods that are already available in the organization, okay? And you report at the end of the activity and when malicious activity is found. Okay, compromise assessment is more similar to an incident response where you don't know if something has been, uh, if there is an incident, actually. So it's not planned. You use supplementary methods. If you have to deploy EDRs, you deploy EDRs. If you need to provision a server or a workstation to analyze logs, you do that, okay, within the infrastructure of the affected organization, okay. And the reports are daily, in our case, uh, even twice, uh, twice a day. Uh, do notify as soon as you find malicious activity, even if it's not a successful malicious activity, you need to notify the detection teams so to see if they are detecting that already. So you have to you try to close the gap in detection. Okay, and that's the that's the approach. So how we try to how to start? Uh, you have to involve the local team. Uh, they are the ones who know the infrastructure. They know they are the ones who know which doors they have to knock and which levers they have to pull for you to do the job. Uh, I don't think you have a chance in, in of success without involving them and really try to be close with them and. Uh, thanks to those guys. Uh, check an entire organization is very different than check a couple of dozen of systems. It's, uh, there's a time limit, actually. So they want to know if they have been compromised yesterday, 
They don't want for tomorrow, they want for yesterday. Uh, and you need a plan. You need a, a plan that you need to know where you are going to start, which uh, systems are, are they going to be the first to check, which systems uh, have been affected, how to check if a system is affected by the vulnerability, uh, and in which order you are going to do that. Okay. And in this case, several issues arise because, uh, for example, the, the best chance that to detect this is web server logs and application logs. But those are not indexed and not centralized. You have to go to the to the source to the to the proper applications. And also, several appliances are affected by this vulnerability. And uh, you need people with knowledge and access to extract those uh, backend logs for you, so you can run your regs, your Jira your rules, your detection rules on them. Okay. Uh, so uh, again, involve the local team. That's the first thing and the best thing you can do. Uh, that's the strategic approach. Uh, the operational approach for us was an iterative approach. Okay, first we identify the log sources in every organization, in both organizations that we can use for this, and we started with a very basic set of detection rules just to detect the basic uh, log for cell activity. For example, GNDI, LDAP. Okay, let's go with that. That string. Uh, we identified the IOCs that we're trying to to exploit this vulnerability and then see if our rules cover all the activity. Then they don't cover all the activity, improve the rule, run the rule again, okay? You identify new ICs, okay? Do it again and you, that, and you repeat and repeat and repeat until you run out of time or you are fairly sure that uh, you have covered all, okay? This is a regular expression that uh, we ended with this, this monstrosity here. And uh, you can follow the same approach for general rules, uh, CM queries, plan queries, elastic search queries, okay? We follow this, this same approach. Uh, thanks to Florian Roth, uh, really, uh, because uh, he provided us with the initial rule and via the, his uh, repository, his public repository, and especially the script to compose this. So we could just introduce new bits uh, in, the, in the regex and then compose. Don't have to edit this um, monstrosity on the fly. Yes, uh, that would be uh, really a pain. So, uh, well, after this, you have your rules, but you have lots and lots and lots of hits on those rules because everybody was trying to exploit this vulnerability during the period we are speaking about. We did this for, during December, from we ran on the logs from the December 1st to December uh, to December 31st, yeah, around that. So it's not possible to do a, a full uh, digital forensic procedure on every asset that is impacted. So then I'm going to look for the secondary, the second stage uh, activity for outgoing connections, okay? For this, you can use the CM, you can use EDR. However, I would recommend to go straight to the to the firewall because there, there is the source of the data. Some CMs, uh, some organizations don't index everything uh, they got in the firewalls uh, only, for example, denied requests or only uh, admitted requests. They don't index everything that you need everything to see. Okay, and a dedicated workstation to do these search, these Jira search, these regex is really advisable. Why? Because you don't want to go and execute uh, a complex Jira on a mission critical server. First, you are not going to have the, the Jira engine. Second, if you have it, maybe you will crash the server. As you don't want that. You don't want to be breaking things while you are trying to tell uh, a customer if they have been compromised in the, in the first place, okay? Well, that's the theory. <laughs> so let's go to see how we apply this in two different organizations, okay? So mostly we were able to follow the, the same approach, but we had to accommodate for, for some things, okay? Uh, both organizations had different level of maturity in the cybersecurity um, uh, realm, and they belong to different sectors. Okay, so different regulatory frameworks, a different kind of data on them. Uh, one was in a single country, just uh, limited to Spain. The other one was a multinational, so several countries uh, that uh, make the chain of communication more difficult, the chain of command more complex. And also re different regulatory frameworks uh, were involved and you cannot take data from some countries to others. So we have to provision additional resources in every one of them. 
Okay. Well, first organization, really old school organization. Okay. Uh, it's from the healthcare sector, a critical operator in the midst of a pandemic. So they were nervous. They were really, really nervous and with reason. Okay, they had a simple and well thought network architecture. So uh, they had very good visibility on what was going in and going out. They weren't so mature in, in terms of cybersecurity, but uh, the IT administrators have been doing that job for 20 years. So they knew the ins and out of their network. They knew where the network flows were coming and when they were going, okay? So they could help us just pointing us where we have to look for everything. We didn't have to figure out anything. We, we just ask, where is this log is here? Okay, thank you. Uh, two years of logs on everything <laughs> and more logs on cold storage. So enterprise uh, backup for everything. Uh, but not all the old school things are, are good. Uh, they didn't provide us with remote access because they don't work on remote. Uh, the thing has had to be deployed on, on site in the midst of a pandemic. Um, that's, that wasn't uh, so nice. They limited us a, a little bit. Uh, no EDR. Okay, They are starting to deploy an EDR, but they don't have any EDR right now. So that wasn't a relevant uh, data source for us in this and no real CM to speak about. They have like a log collector for all the firewalls and all, all the communications, but they didn't have a, a real CM where you can run queries. So you have to grab, grab everything. Okay. So which are the results we discovered in this organization? Well, thousands, thousands of log for server requests. But really, really little uh, few of them, I think like only 50 of them return a uh, uh, 200 OK. So all of them were 400, 300, uh, even some 500 uh, codes on, on there. And very scan like, very, they run batteries of, of tests. Uh, they started with the simple ones, and they started to go through different batteries of, of attempts of exploitation. We didn't find any secondary activity, so that's good in this case. And three, in the other case, we, we didn't, we, neither. We find any secondary activities related with love for sale. To other things, yes, but not to love for sale. So three main sources of data in this case. Web server logs, that's our primary source of data, because we have the request there, we can run that. Uh, the, uh, the firewalls of the DMC, okay, to check a incoming connection and especially outgoing connections and check them with the timestamp of the of the world server logs, uh, which uh, was uh, very manual labor uh, in that way. And proxy logs, just in case uh, the, the domain resolutions and all those things that uh, Jan has already saw last, we also saw that. Okay, so organization two. Uh, it's one organization, but there's 100 heads because it has business areas that are a little bit independent in the IT. Uh, in, the, in the IT realm, uh, they also have different geographical areas that are quite independent in that, and they have a global, uh, a global body of government in that way. Okay, uh, they come from the energy sector again, critical operator, and they were very, very, very worried about being compromised uh, uh, with this uh, vulnerability. Uh, complex network architecture. Um, it's multinational. You, you, uh, traffic originated in one country can go out from the through the uh, through the through other and then go uh, get an, in an egress point that shouldn't be the one that uh, you think on the beginning. But okay, that happened. So it was very difficult to trace that request to its origin, the outgoing request, because uh, incoming we could we were able to to trace them. Uh, Sado IT, Sado IT everywhere. It's a problem. They are aware of the problem and they are trying to fix it, but it's it's very difficult to fix. And also a complex chain of command. So uh, you have to go from global CSO to local CSO to then to the IT guy who really uh, handled that asset to get access. But they had a very good usage of cybersecurity technologies. They were uh far more mature than the first organization and they had a very good coverage with the, the edr they had been doing a really really uh, great job during the last three years to deploy edrs in both workstations and servers and being able to manage all that infrastructure with that uh they got a real cm uh, 
<laughs> that was a wel welcome news for us. And they have an already ongoing uh, threat hunting process. So we just plug into that and just add muscle to that and redirect that uh, threat hunting towards law for sale and uh, uh, provision some workstations to be able to, and an elastic search instance to be able to, to run our queries. Uh, they we already have a established relation with the local team. Uh, we have been working with them since 2018. So uh, we were able to um, really speak with people that we know well and we have a level of, of trust in them and they have a level of trust in us that it was really, really uh, useful. So adapt and overcome. We don't have a so clear uh, path to trace the second stage IOCs. Um, we don't have full access to all, all the request logs for the fragmented uh, chain of command that we have already speak about. Uh, so we use the EDR. We use the EDR to look for exploitation related activity. Commands related to love for sale exploitation, connections of command launches from uh, Java Prime processes, commands launched from Java Prime processes and containing IPs or domains that uh, could be suspicious. Doing this, uh, we found uh, some malicious activity, but not related, not traced to log for sale. So it's not relevant for this tool. Uh, also, Palo Alto Panorama, uh, we didn't have worked with this uh, before, uh, but it was really useful to be able to trace uh, the outgoing connections to its real origin across multiple firewalls across multiple countries. Um, really, really help us and save our, save our assets in there. Okay, what we found uh, here, uh, no activity related with uh, log for sale exploitation. And uh, the distribution of the countries where the, um, where the malicious requests were incoming, the usual, I think that uh, you can see here the usual distribution that you are going to see every time you, you do this kind of investigation. Uh, three main sources of data, again, web server logs. Uh, we were able to put them in our elastic search uh, engine and run queries on them. And also for, for other level of security, Revex and Jara, all of them. Uh, the EDR, uh, we were able to look into the processes. Uh, I think that we couldn't do in the previous organization and outgoing connections to second stage IOCs and Palo, um, Palo Alto Panorama. That was uh, also something that we used to trace back connections. Okay. This is what we did. What we see lock, lock for selling, what, what we can see lock for sale being in the future, okay? Uh, well, I think that we are going to see this more as a lateral movement vulnerability due to, it has been mainly patched in the perimeter, but legacy environments, shadow IT, uh, out, of life, or out of support uh, copies of software or illegal copies of software, shouldn't be used in enterprise environments, but you come across them from time to time. Uh, and also, it's another thing that is not just log for sale, is uh, that a GNDI, uh, um, uh, the disk vector, uh, is, it's not only in log in log for j. Okay, uh, I think that our the Java libraries that does the same thing is uh, lookups, and that they can be exploited in the future. And this has opened uh, Pandora's box, and a lot of people is aware now of that vector. Uh, it has been left mainly alone since 2016, since that, since that book. But I think that the future is not going to be so kind with us. So we should uh, look for, for this kind of uh, vectors in lateral movements of new vulnerabilities that can lead in this way. Uh, well, acknowledgements, yes, because uh, <laughs> I have to. Uh, to Alvaro Muñoz and Oleksan Miros, I just butchered his name, sorry, uh, for the work in the, uh, in the GNDI lookups and uh, remote code, code executions in Java. To Florian Roth for the work he does for incident re response teams. Uh, really, uh, the information he publishes is useful, always useful. And in this case, it, it saved my, my Christmas. So really, thanks. Uh, and to my co-workers who were involved in this in, in this work, uh, Jose Alberto Lopez, Sergio Sant, and Javier Garcia. Uh, and in case you have any complaints about this uh, this talk, uh, just address them to Abel Gonzalez, who is the responsible for me uh, doing it. Uh, he put me up for this, so all the complaints to him. 
some resources we come very engaged uh some ideal queries uh, we use cloud strike in this case so here you have uh, some if you have to do this activity in the future you can come and look for this uh elastic search queries basically doing the doing the same uh, Jira queries uh, just a repository because we mainly use uh, already already crafted Jira queries that uh, um, or Jira search patterns uh, that were prepared by the community and really really useful. Uh, a Palo Alto Panorama query just for PyThread ID. Uh, the queries that we use for um, to trace back the activity is not is not something that is relevant for any other organization. And oh. And here there's a mistake. Uh, this is not a Palo Alto Panorama query. This is basically how to check if your if a system is affected by the vulnerability, both in Linux and Windows. I think this resource is already known by a lot of people, but here it is. And finally, uh, thank you for your time. And I hope that uh, this uh, talk has been useful.